The perpendicular component of the electric field is dictated by the physics of the problem. So we can't change those values or just get rid of them. So the set of equal to zero, that is. They are what they are. However, we're multiplying those perpendicular components by delta n. So if we take the limit where delta n goes to zero, meaning we're scrunching and squishing this rectangular surface to be an infinitesimally wide in the delta n direction, we're basically collapsing it around the material interface, then the contribution of the normal components will also go to zero. So minus E norm one times delta n plus E norm two times delta n will go to zero. And so we are left with minus E tan one times delta L plus E tan two times delta L. Then on the right side of Faraday's law, we're supposed to calculate the total flux, dBdt, passing through the area of the surface in the delta n direction. However, because we're collapsing the surface S along the material interface, we're letting delta n go to zero, the area of the surface uh, also goes to zero. So S also goes to zero. And in this limit, no flux can pass through the surface. So that also goes to zero, and the right side of the equation is equal to zero. So then we wind up with this e tan and e tan two, e tan one and e tan two. This is all equal to zero. And after simplifying, we can cancel the delta L's, and we can move one term to the other side. We get e tan one is equal to e tan two. In other words, the tangential electric field is continuous across a material boundary. What's interesting about this result is that there will be at least some amount of electric field inside of the aluminum. How much electric field there is depends on how much of the wave is reflected. But the aluminum is a good conductor, and it has lots of free electrons. So let's consider the interface here. Here's the aluminum, here's air, we have our electric field. We just discovered that the tangential electric field across that interface will be equal. So the tangential electric field on the surface of the aluminum will create a Coulomb force on all those free electrons. Oops, E. In the aluminum which will in turn generate current along the outside of the aluminum. And the current will only be induced on, along the outside of the aluminum because we've already seen that the electric field decays uh, very rapidly with depth into the aluminum, is that skin depth. So in other words, we're going to, the incident electric, electromagnetic wave is going to induce a current along the surface of the aluminum, the airplane. Since the electric field is measured in volts per meter, the longer the distance over which we have an electric field, the more voltage we'll get across that dimension of the airplane, which corresponds to more current flowing along the outside. Take a slab of aluminum, for example. Draw it over here. Say it's of length d meters. When there's an electric field across it, I'll say here, is our electric field, meaning that this is the positive side, there's a negative side. The total voltage across the length of the slab, V, is the magnitude of E times D. As a result, in our measurement setup, if we want to test the worst case scenario for the airplane, meaning we want to test the effect of inducing the maximum amount of current and voltage across the airplane, in what direction should our airplane be oriented relative to the incoming electromagnetic wave of our measurement setup? And specifically, the electric field in our measurement setup?